All right, well, good morning, Compass West Church. Good to be with you this morning. If you're new with us, my name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here at the Compass West. Glad that you could join us today. Today is a sad, sad Sunday for us. Really sad day. Today we're closing out our sermon series, Skeletons in the Closet. I feel like it's saying goodbye to a good friend that's been with us for almost three months, but we're, we're moving on. Uh, after this Sunday, we're going to do a, a standalone sermon, and then guess what? It's Christmas time. You guys are really excited. All right, Grinches, it's Christmas time. So we're going to be moving to Christmas uh, to an Advent sermon series to go through Christmas, and then it'll be January. It'll be 2022. That's crazy. Uh, I can't believe that's almost here, but here we are. So uh, as we close out the sermon series, I, I just want to spend a couple seconds really quickly with you just recapping what we've been through. A, a few weeks ago, Pastor Jordan sent out an email to our congregation talking about the, the purpose of the sermon series. And it was a, a really well done email. And, and in it, he told the story or uh, the reality of Germany and how Germany, it's a lot in Germany to teach the history uh, of Germany's awful actions seen in World War II to its people so that uh, they do not see a repeat of what happened at the Holocaust. And so everyone knows about what took place at the hands of Germans in Germany. It's a, 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 not a thing of pride, but it's a, a reality that they, they want to make sure they know. And as we looked at the sermon series, we, we've looked at some of the, the dark stains on Christianity. We looked at some of the things that have been done at the hands of the church that have hurt hundreds of thousands of people, that have uh, gone against what Scripture teaches. And, and one of the reasons why we, we went through the sermon series is we wanted to, to make sure that, number one, uh, we understand that as Christians, just because we live in 2021 doesn't mean that we can't make some of the same mistakes that were made in the past. Uh, we often look at the past and we can think, man, I am not like those people, right? We, we have this snobbery about us. And the reality is, is we have broken sinful hearts. And we very easily could go towards where uh, the, the past followers of Jesus have gone. We, we easily could find ourselves living in hypocrisy, living against what Scripture teaches. And, and one of the other reasons why we did this sermon series is, is to help equip us to live out our faith in, in a secular culture. We, we understand that in our world, not, not everyone believes what we believe in our world, especially in Canada, uh, the people who follow Jesus, it's a quite a, a small margin of people. And so people often have questions about what we believe as Christians. People often push against what we believe as Christians. And so through this series, we hope that we've equipped you with some tools to, to, to guide how you could interact with people who might push against your Christian faith. So we, we've tried to do that. And so we've covered things like evil and suffering, things like sex, the, the relationship between the church and science, uh, things about racism, slavery, uh, the reality of, uh, uh, of the hypocrisy in the church. And we looked at these things to hopefully give you guys some tools, some discussion points to, to push back against where you might see uh, our culture pushing against Christianity. So this morning we're in a last skeleton in the closet. We're closing it out and we're going to talk about the Bible. So let's pray together. And we can dive into our text together. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this series. Um, I, I pray that it's been challenging to our hearts. That through it, Holy Spirit, you've spoken to us through your word. And that you've uh, given us just some tools to, to, to take to the world around us as we share the gospel. God, I pray that as we open up your word this morning, that you'd speak to us by the power of your spirit. And as we look at... Uh, the scripture and our relationship as Christians with it, God, that you'd give us a humble heart. So often, Jesus, we approach scripture and we don't approach it with humility, but we approach it with pride. Jesus, so often I know I think I know more than you. And so I just confess that. And I, I need to, to experience your uh, humbling in my life, Jesus. Jesus, I pray this morning that uh, we would sit under your authority, that as we look at what your word says about about your word, that uh, you give us insight, you give us revelation, and you, you transform our hearts this morning. Only you can do this, Holy Spirit, so we pray that your spirit would come and, and work in us. In, in your name, amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to hang out this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 20 is kind of going to be home base for us. We're going to do a little bit of jumping around. But Matthew 5, 17, as you're finding it, let me just do a little bit of an intro. This, the skeleton we're looking at this morning, like I said, is the Bible. 
Uh, and this seems to be a, a pretty common skeleton people have when it comes to the Christian faith. Uh, many people look at Christianity and they don't understand why, why would we look at a book that was written over 2,000 years ago that's, that's made up of uh, authors who wrote to a culture that doesn't reflect ours at all. It's written to people who lived in ancient Rome or the ancient Middle East and it has rules and regulations and all these things that speak to those cultures and not Canada in 2021. Why would we let this book shape us? Why would we follow its rules? Why would we let it shape who we are and how we live? This seems to be a, a common theme that I hear from people. And it's not just people outside the church who believe this. There's even people who at one point claim the name of Jesus who believe this. Rob Bell, who's a former pastor and someone who left the Orthodox Christian faith, sums up this thought well. He says it this way, the church will continue to be even more irrelevant when it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense. In other words, we need to progress, we need to change with the times, and if that, if that means leaving the Bible, that means leaving the Bible, and we need to do it. We need to move forward. And that, that can be uh, a thought that's held all around us. And so in our final sermon this morning in this series, I want to look briefly at the skeleton of the Bible. Uh, and before I dive into it, I just need to give you a brief disclaimer, all right? Uh, the disclaimer is this. I have 35 to 45 minutes, maybe 50, we'll see, all right, to unpack this. I know you're training for 35. We'll, we'll try, all right? Uh, I am not going to be able to answer every question when it comes to this. There's a there's hundred different ways we could go as we unpack this topic this morning. And so if, if I don't hit your question, you can email Pastor Jordan this morning, all right? Jordan at compassregina.com, and he will answer every one of your questions for you. And he will do a great job because he knows way more than I do, all right? So there you go. Just kidding. You can ask me or Jordan after the service if you have any questions or any uh, critiques or, or, or questions around this topic. Because it is a big one. I understand that. This can be a topic that we wrestle with. And so, so as I unpack this, here's where I'm going to go this morning. I'll give you my cheat sheet notes for you, all right? Where I'm going to look this morning is, is why do we trust the Bible? I'm going to answer that question. What the Bible is all about and the Bible's purpose in the Christian life. So why do we trust the Bible? What is the Bible all about? and the Bible's purpose in the Christian life. All right, you guys ready? 35 minutes on the clock. Let's go. Look at Matthew 5, 17 with me. All right. Do not think, this is Jesus talking, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. If you have your own Bible, I'd circle abolish. That's a pretty key word for us this morning. Abolish the law or the prophets. Law or the prophets is kind of a way of saying the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Uh, that word fulfill, again, I'd circle or underline star. That's an important word for us this morning. I've come to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or not a dot will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them, whoever does them, that word does could also be uh, whoever uh, practices them, whoever does or practices them. Let me find my spot again. Whoever does or does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus in our text today, he, he covers all three of our points that we're going to look at. So, so why do we trust the scriptures? The first point. Why do we trust the scriptures? Well, we trust them because Jesus trusts the scriptures. Look at verse 17 again with me. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Jesus is saying he, he didn't come to remove the scripture, the Old Testament scripture, that word abolishes an interesting word. It's this idea of destruction, of, of wiping out. You know, if you're ever doing renovations in your house and you need to destruct your house, you need to destroy it, please call me, all right? I love breaking things, especially when it's not my stuff. 
So one of my friends, I always tell us people, like, if you're doing renovations, I'd love to come take apart your house for you. So one of my friends, uh, he bought a, a new house, and he, or not a new house, an older house, and he was redoing the basement, and he took me up on this. He called me and said, hey, Luke, I'm taking apart my basement. I, you always say, let me come over and, and help you break stuff. This is your chance. So I went over there, and, man, we tore apart everything. There was not anything left in the basement besides the cement slab and the cement walls, and it was awesome. I threw hammers through the wall. I kicked stuff. I ran through one wall. There was a two-by-four in it, and so it didn't really work out. It kind of hurt. But, you know, it was a fun time. But we systematically tore apart the basement. We abolished it. That, that's what that Jesus is saying. I did not come to systematically deconstruct or tear apart the Old Testament scriptures. I didn't come to remove them. In saying this, Jesus is, is saying the Old Testament scriptures are still valid. In fact, he goes on to teach them. If you look at verse 21, it's, it's the famous Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you have heard it said. That's pointing back to the Old Testament, the, the law of Moses and the prophets. You have heard it said, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. What Jesus does is he clarifies the Old Testament. He upholds God's word and does not rewrite it, does not throw it to the side, but, but teaches it. He brings clarity to it. So the, the Bible, the, the Bible is one book made up of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. The, the Bible is God's word and Jesus holds it up as good, as authoritative, as trustworthy. And, and here in Matthew, 17, or Matthew 5, 17, he points back to the Old Testament and says the Old Testament scriptures are trustworthy, they're good. And so maybe you're like, okay, Jesus affirms the Old Testament as trustworthy, as good. What about the New Testament? Good question. I'm glad you asked. Thank you. That's where I was going to go next. In the, Old, or the New Testament, it's made up of 27 books, like I said. And the first four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're called the Gospels. And these four books are the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and ministry as he walked this earth. And the question you might be, do, does Jesus view the, the New Testament, the four Gospels in particular, as authoritative, as, as trustworthy scriptures from God to us? And I would say the answer is yes. We see this in John 12, 49, where he says, I haven't spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me. Or when Jesus gives the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Jesus commands his disciples to go, teaching people to obey all that he had commanded them. Jesus' words, his teaching, carry the authority, the weight of Scripture. The weight of God's authoritative words to us. If we were to leave out the Gospels, we would leave out the main point of Scripture, which is what Jesus came to say and do for us. Well, maybe you've watched The Da Vinci Code. Anyone here watch The Da Vinci Code? Tom Hanks? All right. Tom Hanks is one of my favorite actors. In fact, he gets two stars in my sermon today. I mentioned him twice. But, but Tom Hanks, anything that guy says, I want to believe because he is just dreamy. But... Uh, He's in the Da Vinci Code, and if you've watched the Da Vinci Code or read the book, or, or maybe you've heard some of the, the stories about there's other Gospels out there. There's other accounts of, of who Jesus was or, and what he came to do or, or say to you. And this is what the Da Vinci Code highlights for us in the movie or the book. And a lot of times people think, all right, yeah, there's the four Gospels that the church picked, but what about the other Gospels out there? And, and we can seem to take the Da Vinci Code as history, and I hate to break this to you, the Da Vinci Code is fiction. All right, just so we're clear. It's not a historical account of reality. It's a fictional book and movie. Uh, and the reality is there isn't a whole bunch of other Gospels out there. There isn't a whole bunch of early Gospels that also report on the life and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, uh, the Gospels we have in the Bible are dated back to the first century. All right, so they're, they were written within the, the time period of Jesus' life. And the next oldest date on the, the Gospels is the early second century. So right uh, after Jesus' life and resurrection. And no matter how convincing the Da Vinci Code can be or Tom Hanks can be, no matter how dreamy he is, this idea that there's other teachings out there that the church held on to, like the, the Gospel of Judas or these other books, no matter how much we want to believe that these things exist and the church believed them, the reality is, is the early church didn't have them. It didn't believe them. The early church was, was quite, quite united on, on orthodox belief. 
it was quite united on, on what it constituted as the Gospels of Jesus. In fact, what we would call the other Gospels or the lost Gospels, they didn't come around until the late second, second century, uh, over a hundred years after what we would call the Gospels today. So these books were written in opposition to the four Gospels. They were written to try to stir up controversy, to, to try to take the church away from what the Gospels already said. And so this idea that there's other Gospels out there that were written from the same time period as the ones that we have in our Bible today just is not true. All right, so the Gospels, Jesus affirmed them as his words, and his words were equated with God's authority in Scripture. What about the rest of the New Testament, Acts to Revelation? What about those words? Are those words that Jesus considered those to be authoritative for us as God's word to us? You see, Jesus didn't believe that Scripture stopped with him, that, that God's story stopped with him. If you remember the New Testament, uh, Jesus continually talked about his mission moving forward, God's story in this world moving forward. We see this again in the great commandment, or the great uh, command in, in Matthew 28, where Jesus sends the disciples out. We see this in Acts 1 as he sends the, the apostles out to take his mission to uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. We also see this in places like John 14 where he says his Holy Spirit is going to come fill the disciples and they will do greater works that were, they could ever dream of when he, disab- when he re- leaves this earth. We see this in uh, John 16. That the disciples will be filled with the Holy Spirit and he will guide them into truth. Revealing everything that was Jesus and his teaching to declare to people around them. And so as, as Jesus sends his apostles, his disciples out, he sends them with the authority to speak out the commands that he had taught them and to take what the Holy Spirit reveals them to us and to teach those things as authoritative. The New Testament, the Acts to Revelation part of it, was viewed by the early church as from God to them. They, the early church and the, the early writings constantly refers to books from Acts to Revelation written by the apostles as being received to them. Not things they came up with, but, but documents, word of God sent to them that they received from God. These, these books were written under, by people under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and they were accepted by the early church as God's word to them. And so even as Jesus walked this earth, we see him sending out his disciples with his commands and these commands were viewed as authoritative. I think a good place for us to start this morning when it comes to the Bible, a good place for us to start is with our trust in Jesus. See, our trust in the Bible flows out of our trust in Jesus. If Jesus affirmed the the 66 books that we call Holy Scripture as good and authoritative to himself, if he believed that, then if we trust Jesus, we should too. I love what author Andrew Wilson says in his book, Unbreakable. He says, I do not trust in Jesus because I trust the Bible. Let me say that again. I do not trust in Jesus because I trust in the Bible. I trust the Bible because I trust in Jesus. I love him. And I've decided to follow him. So if he talks and acts as the Bible is trustworthy, authoritative, good, helpful, and powerful, I will too. Even if some of my questions remain unanswered or my answers remain unpopular. Because Jesus affirms scripture is good, authoritative, trustworthy, true. As Christians, we do too. We do too. Again, there's a lot of different rabbit trails we could go down there. We could talk about text criticism and, and how we know we have the earliest manuscripts. We could look at all that stuff. But I, I think it has to come back to this. Do do we trust Jesus? Do we trust Jesus? All right. So why do we trust the scriptures? Well, because Jesus did. Number two, what is the Bible all about? What is the Bible all about? Jesus gets this in our text too, and he does it kind of an interesting way. It's really interesting how Jesus addresses this. You see, in, in Jesus' day, there were, there were two main ways of looking at scriptures. And these two main ways were, were lived out by two groups of religious leaders. One called the Sadducees. And one called the Pharisees. And the Sadducees uh, were, were quite a bit different than the Pharisees. The Sadducees were like the progressives of Jesus' day. They were more liberal in their, their views of culture and the authorita- authoritative nature of Scripture. You see, the, the progressive or the, the Sadducees uh, were, were more happy with Roman government. They didn't want to overthrow Rome. They wanted to work with it to bring in this Greco-Roman good life. 
they, they, they really wanted to see that take place, and their interpretation of Scripture followed that idea. Uh, the, the Sadducees didn't believe in the supernatural, so they didn't believe in miracles. So as Jesus is doing these miracles, they, they couldn't believe it. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe that was going to happen. They, they didn't follow the whole entire Old Testament. What we have is the Old Testament. They only followed the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. They believed the prophets and the other writings were not authoritative. When it came to their view of Scripture, they, they held Scripture very loosely. And this is what Jesus picks up on in, in our text. Look at verse uh, 18 with me. Sorry, verse 19. Jesus says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of these commandments and, and teaches others to do the same, they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. This is what the Sadducees did. They, they relaxed Scripture. If there was a part of Scripture that went against kind of their cultural preferences what they enjoyed, what they liked, they would say, well, well, the Bible doesn't really teach that. That's not really what God meant by this. When it talks about, you know, what, whatever Moses commanded, he didn't really mean it this way. He meant it more this way, so we don't have to listen to it. They would find ways around following the authoritative nature of Scripture. They, they twisted it to meet their cultural preferences so they could experience the good life. They, they didn't believe that the Bible held authority over them. It was more of a neat book, nice literature. A good set of suggestions that if you want to, you can follow. But if it kind of pushes against you, you don't have to. We, we see this take place in their lives when they're with Jesus in Mark chapter 12. You guys remember Mark, don't you? Remember like the like four years we spent in the book of Mark? Those are great. Man, I miss those. Said no one ever. Uh, in Mark 12, you guys aren't laughing this morning. Man, I don't know what's going on. You guys need more coffee. Mark 12, all right. The Sadducees, they ask them this hypothetical question. Uh, they paint this picture of a woman who has seven husbands. She married one, one, one guy, and he had seven brothers, or five, six brothers, sorry. And the, the husband she married dies, and she goes through all the brothers. And they say, in, in heaven, when the resurrection happens, who will be her husband? Who will she be married to? And, and it's really interesting. The Sadducees ask this question. What's interesting, all right, they don't believe in the resurrection. And so they're, like, they're trying to like poke at Jesus and his belief of Scripture. And Jesus goes after them in our text, in Matthew 12, sorry. He goes after them. He says, they're mistaken and in error. Why? Because they do not believe the Bible or what it says. And Jesus just pokes at them. You do not understand what you're even asking because you don't even believe the Bible. Jesus condemns them. He says they're missing out on the power of God in their lives and their ministry because of their view of scriptures. So, so that's the Sadducees. That's, that's one way the culture in Jesus' day viewed the scriptures. It was all about kind of these, these rules for life that you could follow or not follow. It was, it was subjective. On the other hand, there's the Pharisees. And this other group of, of religious leaders in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, they were the complete opposite. If the Sadducees were the progressives, the Pharisees are the fundamentalists. All right? They, they love the Old Testament scriptures. They loved it a lot. See, Jesus addressed them here in verse 20. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that would have been a very shocking statement in, in Jesus' day for the crowd around them. Because the, the Pharisees were the righteous people of the day. They followed all the Old Testament commands. They, they loved following the rules. All right? Any oldest child here? Like, I'm the oldest in my family. I'm a rule follower. I love rules. Like, except for the speed limit, I love the rules that I need to follow. I, I have to follow them. That was the Pharisees. When, when the Bible says something, that was good enough for them. They followed it. In fact, they made other rules around the rules just to make sure they didn't break any of the rules. They loved rules. They thought the whole point of the scriptures were to follow the rules. But in, in their view of scripture as all being about rules, they missed it. Turn over to John chapter 5 real quick with me. John chapter 5, if your Bible's open, just flip over a few pages. John chapter 5, Here, here's an interesting exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees and, and their view of Scripture. Look at verse 39 when you find it. John 5, 39. Jesus says this to the, the Pharisees. He says, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. 
I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do you not think that I will accuse you? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about he wrote of me. So, so in this text, Jesus is saying, you guys love the scriptures. You know them. You search them. You spend time diving into them. You study them like crazy, and yet you've missed the whole point of them. They're, they're about me. You see this in, in our text in Matthew. Jesus says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I have not come to abolish the law, or the, the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. That word fulfill is like the, the, the main point, the climax in a movie. Jesus says in John 5 that they've searched the scriptures. They know them by heart. They know the word of Moses, but they missed what Moses was writing about. He was writing about Jesus. All the laws, all the writings of the prophets were pointing to the coming Messiah. Jesus who would enter this world, who would bring in God's kingdom. And, and the Pharisees missed it. They knew the, the law, the Torah, they knew it forwards, backwards, upside down, but they couldn't see the point of it, which was Jesus. You guys ever been to a wedding before? Anyone? Yeah? Good. I'm glad you have friends. I'm glad. I, I had a, the pleasure of doing a wedding this summer for uh, a guy who was part of my youth group when I was a youth pastor in Estes Van. His name's Landon. I call him Landon because he's a, a farmer from Saskatchewan, and I think it's funny. Uh, at, at his wedding, uh, if you've been to any wedding, there, there's two really big parts of the wedding. Number one, the, the first big part of a wedding is when the bride comes in, right? Like everyone stands, the groom usually is crying, grandma's crying. It's this precious moment in the wedding. The, the second big part in the wedding is, is when the officiant says, after everyone's signed the paperwork, so then the vows, the officiant says, you may kiss your wife the husband, right? Everyone starts cheering. And, and the whole focus of that moment is on the officiant, right? It's on me. You know, I, I poke out from behind the couple. I'm like, yeah. And the photographer's taking my picture. You know, I'm jumping up from behind them so they can see my bald head and my big face, right? Like, it, it, it's all about me in that moment. So I ruined all their photos at their wedding because I was poking out, giving bunny ears. And no, the point of that moment isn't me. All the pictures from their wedding, when they're, when they're kissing, I am blurred out in the background. Like the camera is focused on Landon and Kayla having their first kiss as a married couple. That's the fulfillment of the day. That's the whole point of the ceremony. Them becoming one. The whole point of our Bible compass the whole fulfillment of scriptures is Jesus. The law, everything else, it's there. It's in the background. Now. It's, it's fuzzy. The camera's focused in on Jesus. Listen, I, I think in our, our day today, we can fall into one or two ditches. The same as in Jesus' day. We, we can treat the Bible, the holy scriptures, not as it's about Jesus, but as it's about our lives. We can make it all about us. How can you have your best life now? How can you have your dreams and fulfillments met? How can you experience everything you want? And when, you, when that's the purpose of Scripture to you, if that's how you view it, you know what you're going to do? You're going to do just what the, the uh, Sadducees did. You're going to treat it as a nice book that has some good suggestions, and you'll parry, or cherry pick the parts that you like that fit your desires and your dreams. And whatever comes against you, you'll, you'll cut out. So that, that, that's nice, but it's not for our culture today. That's nice, but, you know, it was written to these people at this time, so it doesn't really apply to us. That's nice, but it's not in red. It's not Jesus' words to us. We, we see this happen all the time. You know, Mark Clark last week in our sermon video, he, sa he said something towards the end that wasn't anything to do with our topic. But he said a lot of times people push back against Christianity because it doesn't let them sleep with the people they want to sleep with. That is such a, a true statement. We, we cut out scripture because it, it puts boundaries on our sex life. We're not going to go back to our sex sermon, don't worry. But we, we do that. 
we, we can view the, the scriptures as, a, as good advice for us, but not authoritative. Or, or we can fall into the other side, where we make it all about rules and regulations and laws that we've got to follow. Some of you, this is what you believe scriptures are about. When, when you think about Christianity, all you think about is kind of like the, this hard-nosed rules that you've got to follow. Things you've got to do to make God happy. Maybe that's been your experience with the church. And, and the, the good news is that's not at all what the Bible's about. The Bible is about Jesus who came into this world to, to see the inbreaking of God's kingdom, to give you and me new hearts through his life, death, and resurrection, to give us new desires, new passions, new hope, new dreams. Ones that reflect God's purpose in this world. And with that comes a desire to honor God in our lives. With that comes a desire to follow him, to say no to our passions and desires and say yes to his. It's all about Jesus. What is the Bible all about? It's all about Jesus, Compass. We, we can never forget that. It's all about Jesus. All right. Third and finally, how's the timer doing? Are, are we getting close to 35 minutes? Third and finally, what, what's the purpose of Scripture for Christians? What is the purpose of Scripture for Christians? The, the purpose of Scripture is to transform us. To transform us. Look what Jesus says in verse 19 again. He talks about relaxing the, the commandments. And then he goes on to uh, say, if I can find it, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Or, or whoever practices them. You see, the Bible is there for our, our transformation. It's not just to be studied for knowledge's sake. Although we can do that. It's not that it's just to be known, although it's good to know what the Bible says. But the, the Bible, God's word, is given to us for our transformation. To let the truth of God transform our hearts, our lives, our actions, every, every aspect of our lives. Some people call this discipleship. Some people call this spiritual formation, sanctification. But it's us being conformed to the image of Jesus. As we spend time in God's word, it, it works as a, a putty knife, shaping us, forming us by the grace of God as we discover Jesus and what he wants our lives to look like. And as, as our lives are transformed, we, we put that truth into action. Look what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 3 14 to 17 about the, the purpose of Scripture. It says in verse, verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it, and how from a childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings or scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So, so through scripture we get introduced to who Jesus is and how Jesus wants to transform our lives, makes us wise into salvation. Verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be completely equipped for every good work. Paul gives us four purposes here. Four purposes of Scripture. Number one, teaching. To, to tell us all the ways we can align our lives with Jesus. Number two, for reproof or rebuke. All right, it tells us all the ways we aren't aligned with Jesus. Number three, correction calls us back to alignment with Jesus. Are you, are you catching a theme here? Back to alignment with Jesus. And number four, training. Number four is interesting to me. This idea of training is this idea of, of tutoring or parenting, seeing someone go from infancy to maturity. All right? So as parents, we, we have one goal. Parent, you have one a couple goals, actually. Keep your kids alive. That's one of them. That's a good one to have. Uh, help your kids meet and find Jesus. But, but three, see them mature in their lives, right? And so, like, in my house, we're constantly telling our kids, hey, use your manners, please and thank you. Why? Because that's part of maturing. Hey, don't put so much food in your mouth. That's not good for you. You could choke and die. Keep them alive. All right? Like, we, we want to see them mature. We, we teach them. If you hurt your sibling, it's not always nice. Say, I'm sorry. Repent of your sin. We, we have all these actions so that hopefully as they grow up, they mature into adulthood. You know, we want to see them learn how to zipper merge so they can drive properly in Regina. We have all these goals to see maturity happen in, in our kids. And that's what Paul is saying. The Word of God helps us as Christians grow from infancy to maturity in Christ so that we may be complete. So that we may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
Now, what's interesting about Jesus' words and Paul's words here in 2 Timothy is the goal of reading Scripture is not information, but transformation. The goal of us reading Scripture is not information, but transformation. Now, there, there are times where we read for information, for sure. Like, I'm guilty of that. It's, it's needed in our lives. We need to know the God. We need to be informed about who he is and what he's like for our transformation, for sure. But the, the Bible, we often can treat the Bible as a source of information alone. You know, we live in the information super age, right? If you want to know anything, just Google it. Ask Siri. Hey, Siri, what, what's this or that? You, you can find out anything by, by Googling. And if you want to know how to do something, you go on YouTube and watch a video about it. You can get information all the time. You can know everything. And we can treat the Bible that way. What, what does the Bible say about this topic or that topic? That, that's helpful to know. But the Bible's primary purpose is transformation. Transformation. See, when we treat the Bible as it's not about transformation but information, we, we don't see it do the role that we want to, that its purpose is made for. And part of that comes back to our heart posture. As you open up Scripture Compass, what, what is your heart's posture? Is it just to, to learn some new things or to be transformed by God? And it's, it's a really important question for us to ask this week. And so a, as you leave this place, as you maybe reflect on, on today, at home this week, as we talk about at GPS this week, had discussions over coffee or, or beer with friends this week, this is a question that we need to ask. What, what is our heart's posture when it comes to Scripture? All right, Tom Hanks again. You guys seen the movie Captain Phillips? Great movie. Love it. There's a scene where their boat gets taken over by the Somalian pirates. And they are in control of the boat. And the, the pirate looks at Captain Phillips and he says, look at me. I'm the captain now. I'm the captain now. Isn't that so often our heart towards God when it comes to our faith? Our, our heart posture to the scriptures don't, don't we look at God and say, I'm the captain now? Follow what I want to do. Follow what my desires are. You know, I have a little niece who's three years old, and she constantly tells me no when we watch her. I'm like, hey, Khaleesi, get me a blanket. No. Khaleesi, do this. No. And, and the heart of that is this idea, like, you're not the boss of me, Right? I'm the captain, not you. I'm the boss, not you. Do you experience that in your life when it comes to your relationship with God's word? Is that, is that your heart posture? Is it one that says, God, you're no longer the captain of the ship I am. Are you a critic of the Bible or do you allow the Bible to be a critic of you? This is what John Mark Comer calls the greatest challenge of the spiritual life. Learning to give up the illusion of control. So often our heart posture is one of control. We want to control our lives. We want to control our spiritual lives. We want to control our passions. We want to do what we want to do. But the Bible comes to us and it says, lay down your arms. Give up control. Submit. Surrender. Or simply just, just trust. Trust. It, it forces us to confront our control issues. Compass, do you have a control issue this morning? If, if you do, you're in company with me. I have one. I want to control everything. So, so how do we come face to face with our control issue? We experience the gospel. We experience the gospel. When we understand the gospel, we understand it as an invitation to us to come to Jesus, to realize that we have no hope apart from him, that we aren't able to save ourselves, that we aren't able to 
redeem our sinful hearts, that only Jesus can do that. That's a place of weakness. And we come to Jesus in a place of weakness. We lay down control and we trust in him. And this morning, compass to, to follow God's word, to have a posture of humility before God when it comes to his word, we need to remember the gospel. It's only through Jesus and his love and grace that we can experience life. It's only through Jesus and his love and grace that we can submit ourselves, that we can surrender ourselves, that we can trust him and what he calls us to through his word. So, Compass, the question is, what's your heart posture? What's your heart posture? If your heart posture is hard towards Jesus this morning, as we respond through communion and worship, I just invite you to pray with me Jesus, would you give me a soft heart? Jesus, would you build trust in my life so that I would trust you, that I would lay down my rights, my fight against you and surrender to you? Let's pray together. Jesus, so often we cling to control. So often we want to do things our way. And and when we open up your word, it, it comes against us. And so this morning, God, I pray First and foremost, Jesus, that you give us a big picture of who you are, that we see you as a loving God who pursues us, who comes after us, who, who fights to redeem us. God, as we see your love and your grace for us through the cross, through your life, death, and resurrection, Jesus, we'd once again be reminded of your love and your care for us. And as that happens, that we would trust you, Jesus, that we'd be willing to surrender our control. We'd be willing to lay down our arms and and follow you. God, thank you so much for your word and how it reveals Jesus to us. How it reveals who he is and what he's done for us. Jesus, thank you that that the Bible is all about you and and your pursuit of us. And so this morning as we respond to your word and worship, God, would you give us eyes to see you, Jesus. To see your beauty, your glory, and your love for us. We pray this in your name. Amen.